I'm the Amateur Logician from AmateurLogician.com. I hope you are doing well. In this video, we're going to explore Russell's paradox. There's a contradiction in the heart of what we today call naive set theory. Now, this contradiction was discovered by the great philosopher and logician Bertram Russell. Now, loosely speaking, a set is a collection of things. It's a group of things. It contains things. It might be all real numbers. It might be the set of all U.S. presidents. It also might be entirely empty. Then we have the so-called empty set. The set might be infinite in size or finite in size. But regardless, naive set theory is based on two axioms. These are starting assumptions of the theory, and we can then logically derive various things from them. But one of those axioms leads to a contradiction, so that axiom cannot be true, and that also proves that the theory is no good at the end of the day. So on the one hand, with naive set theory, we have the so-called axiom of extensionality. And all that's basically saying is that two sets are equal if they have the same exact members, no more, no less. Pretty straightforward, common sense actually, and it's not controversial. On the other hand, we have the so-called axiom of comprehension. And here is where we lead or are led into trouble. Because that axiom is so liberal, so to speak, it leads to chaos or anarchy, if you will. Because it basically says that for any condition out there, there will be a set that actually satisfies that condition. That's the troublemaker. Now, as I said, loosely speaking or approximately speaking, a set is a collection. Is a collection of objects, although it might be empty. Now, generally, we can think about the notation this way. On the one hand, we have extensive notation. And here, when we're using extensive notation to refer to a set, we explicitly name the members of that set. That's it. For example, let's think about the set 1, 2, 3. We just listed out the members, 1, 2, 3. Or, I don't know, green, red, blue. We just listed out the members of that set. Moreover, I should say that we can have sets within sets. For example, we can have the set 1, 2, 3, and that set 1, 2, 3. That's perfectly legitimate. And here we have four members, 1, 2, 3, 4. We can also use intensive notation. And here, we're going to specify a universal general feature that all members have. For example, let's say we have the set of all U.S. presidents. So rather than listing them out one by one, we just say, hey, this set contains all U.S. presidents. Now, to be sure, I'm using a slightly more informal language here than a textbook might require, but for our purposes, this is okay. Another possibility, as I said, we can have the empty set. There are no members in that set. Another notation would be the following to represent the empty set. Another possibility is the set A contains itself. That's another possibility. And if you study basic set theory, you will learn about the union of sets, the intersection of sets. You'll think about subsets and proper subsets. And you'll also think about power sets and more. But let's think about this a little bit more formally. So we have two axioms. We have the axiom of extensionality. So how can we think about that in a semi-formal manner? So let's do that. We have the axiom of extensionality. So it's making explicit what equality means in set theory. We can say something like the following. For any sets, let's say A and B, A is equal to B if and only if, where we use IFF for if and only if, for all X, so the upside down A is for all, so for all X, X is an element or member of set A if and only if x 
is a member or element of set B. For example, the set 1, 2, 3 is equal to the set 3, 1, 2. Notice the order doesn't matter because we have a 1, a 1, a 2, a 2, a 3, a 3. They have the same exact members. They are equal to each other. This is pretty uncontroversial and obvious. And then we have the axiom of comprehension. That's where the trouble starts. So we can write this in a semi-formal manner the following way. So we have the axiom of comprehension. So we're saying that for any condition, we'll call that C, there exists, and I will use the backwards E for exists, a set, let's call that A, such that for all X, X is an element or member of set A if and only if X satisfies the condition C. And again, we can make this a little bit more formal, I suppose, with the notation, but for our purposes, this is good. There's a set of things satisfying any given condition. But this axiom cannot be true because it leads to contradictions. And this is what leads us to, we have Russell's set. So here we're led into problems. We'll say R is Russell's set and is equal to X such that X is a set and X is not an element or member of X. It is the set of all sets that do not include themselves as elements. Now this is very much reminiscent or parallel to the so-called Barber's Paradox, which we covered some months ago on this YouTube channel. It's very much analogous to it. Now most sets will fall under R without a problem, okay? So if you think about the real numbers, I'm using the fancy symbol for real numbers, that is not an element of the real numbers, right? So that would be included in this possibility. But the question then becomes, what about the set R itself? Because either the set of all sets that does not include themselves as members includes itself or does not include itself. So either R is not a member of itself or R is a member of itself. But then think about the logic here. Is R an element of R? Because if it is, if it is true, then it is false. And if it is false, then it is true. So if it is not a member of itself, it thereby must be a member of itself. Since we are told at the very outset that R contains all sets, they're not members of themselves. So if it's not a member of itself, we're led to the conclusion that it must be a member of itself. But that is a contradiction. And on the other hand, if R is a member of itself, it thereby must not be a member of 
itself. Since we are told, again, at the very outset, that R contains all sets that are not members of themselves, we have a contradiction. If we assume R is a member of itself, we are led to the conclusion that it is not. Alternatively, if we assume that R is not a member of itself, we are led to the conclusion that it is a member of itself. So in either case, in either assumption, either it is or it is not, we are led to a contradiction of that assumption. That is Russell's paradox. Because either the set of all sets that does not include themselves as members includes itself as a member, and then, in that case, it's not included itself as a member because it cannot be a member of itself. But if we exclude it as a member, that is a set that does not include itself as a member, and so it should be a member. And either way, we just end up in a big, fat contradiction. And this is exactly what led Bertram Russell to develop a theory of types, because he wanted to get rid of the contradiction. So I am the Amateur Logician from AmateurLogician.com. This has been an introduction to Russell's Paradox. There's a contradiction in the heart of naive set theory. If you like this video, please consider sharing it on social media. I would appreciate it. You can also buy me a cup of coffee if you want to see more videos like this and want to support um, this YouTube channel and this endeavor. Um, I have a mission, so to speak, to help us all think more logically and clearly uh, to bring back a more classical education, which also doesn't exclude modern logic or modern developments. And this is one of the more interesting topics, naive set theory being unstable. Thank you for watching this video. Please consider giving it a like. Good luck to you and be well.